have a disease like this, they should be concerned and fear because this is a scary disease. But there should be reasonable concern and reasonable fear. Fear has never helped society deal with any problem. So since we know that it's, it's a destructive reaction, it's a normal human reaction, but it's also very destructive and paralyzing. My sister is real paranoid, like, well, we can't, you know, catch anything from you, can we? And no matter how many times I explain, she's still, you know, afraid. Maybe they have to hear the message over and over and over again, and from in, in, in different manners. But I know that saying it once is not enough. AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. It's a big name with even bigger implications. It is not only the name for a disease, it is another name for fear. As a disease, it confronts many of us with a sense of our own mortality. As a source of fear, it confronts even more of us with our own humanity. We would estimate that there are approximately a million people who are, have been infected with the virus through sexual contact, intravenous drug use, etc. But unlike other sexually transmitted diseases and diseases that are transmitted by blood and blood products, this disease, once you develop the full-blown syndrome of AIDS, is universally fatal, really. It is justly fearful to recognize that we face an epidemic, a sudden and rapid spread of AIDS to thousands of people in this country. It is equally fearful that some 50% of these people have died, that to date, no one has recovered, that over one million others may be infected with the virus that causes AIDS, that we still have not produced a cure or a vaccine. In the face of these facts and the fears they promote, the unknown that can tip the balance between reality and hysteria is us, the people. People who care enough to understand the disease and to cope with it intelligently. This program is dedicated to taking us beyond fear into intelligent understanding, coping, and prevention. AIDS is frightening for many reasons. Among them is the fact that it seems to challenge our 20th century notion that science has a ready answer for any problem that confronts us. AIDS is also a mystery to many of us. A mystery because it seemingly came from nowhere. In the late spring of 1981, Dr. Michael Gottlieb first reported five cases of this pneumocystis pneumonia among homosexual men. Uh, it soon became clear that an unusual cancer was occurring also in gay men. This was really the first time that we'd ever seen an epidemic of cancer and an epidemic of severe infections uh, occurring uh, at the same time. And the common link had to be a breakdown in immunity, a breakdown in the immune system. It soon became apparent that this disease was not restricted to gay men. Next, it was found among intravenous drug users, then people with hemophilia and recipients of blood transfusions. The evidence was growing that the cause was not only something new, but something transmitted by blood. Its sudden appearance on the human scene is perhaps not as unsettling as the way it works. AIDS results from a virus known as HTLV-3 that attacks and immobilizes the very part of our system that normally protects us from viruses, from infections, from other foreign invaders. The resulting infections take advantage of this unique opportunity offered them by the weakened defense system. So they are often called opportunistic infections. Most common among these are a parasite called pneumocystis carinii pneumonia and a number of tumors or cancers not usually found in the general population. I feel like I'm just waiting around to die. When a person is infected by HTLV-3, that does not mean that these infections and AIDS itself will necessarily be contracted. We know that some individuals who were exposed uh, over five years ago uh, to the virus have only recently developed disease. It may be as more time goes on that we may find out that in some individuals it may take even longer to develop the full-blown disease. And because of this long incubation period, we do not know whether all individuals who are infected will go on to develop a severe disease or only a small proportion of those. We now know that there are three possible results once the virus enters the bloodstream. Since AIDS is a, an infectious disease, uh, the first step is actually exposure and infection with the virus that we know is HTLV-3. 
uh, usually at that point the patient is, is not um, aware of any change in his uh, physical condition. Have you noticed pain here? A number of those infected with the virus develop some relatively mild symptoms. This condition is called AIDS-related complex, or more simply, ARC. Are they tender? Uh, yeah. I think they are slightly enlarged since last visit. These patients have lymph node enlargement or lymphadenopathy. They may have some minor uh, evidence of infection. That is, they may have infection in the mouth with uh, a yeast called thrush. They may have some weight loss. They may have some yeah. uh, sweats, night sweats, but without any defined or definite infection. A growing percentage of the people with AIDS virus infection progress on to full-blown AIDS. The hallmark of the full syndrome is the appearance of opportunistic infections, such as pneumocystis carinii pneumonia or a rare cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma. So I knew that I had uh, had sexual relations with, I guess you would call them bisexual men. They did my bronchoscopy and diagnosed me on October 13, 1983 with pneumocystis and AIDS. And I was relieved. I really was. They kept saying to me, your diagnostic challenge. We can't figure out what's wrong with you. I was tired of hearing that. I wanted to get, you know, find out what was wrong and take care of it. Um, they usually had a cold or the flu or something like that, but nothing as severe as that pneumonia. It's really, if you let it get you, it's really horrible. We're seeing forms of cancer that are usually typically older patient cancers and suddenly young people are getting these diseases. Mercoposis is one, but there are many other types. Ken Meeks learned he had AIDS on Valentine's Day in 1985. It first took the form of a skin cancer. Telling his family about AIDS posed a double challenge for Ken. His biggest problem was telling me that he was gay. That's right. That's right. That, I think that was the biggest problem. That would be the last thing we would do is disown you. How can anybody disown their children? Something I, I can't understand. But I guess we're not all the same, right? Strictly speaking then, these symptoms of full-blown AIDS are actually the symptoms of those infections that the person with AIDS has contracted. And if death occurs, it is caused by those infections which ravage the body because the immune system has lost its ability to fight them off. The person with AIDS does not readily develop immunity to many of these infections. Because of the weakened immune system, the person with AIDS may face repeated bouts of these infections. As they recur, their effects become more and more devastating and treatment grows less effective. Also alarming is the fact of long-term damage to the brain or the nervous system. And as we learned more and more about the AIDS virus, it did become clear that in fact, the virus not only infects and affects the immune system, but also the central nervous system. And that is very alarming. Because we might find people three, five, ten years down the road who don't have AIDS in the classical sense of, of the word, uh, but have uh, dementia, their ability, uh, their intellectual functions are impaired, maybe even their motor functions are impaired. Um, that could have a tremendous impact socially and economically uh, on, on uh, this country and the world. Unfortunately, we do not have a vaccine for AIDS, nor do we have any chemical cure that will return a person with AIDS to normal health. Why is a cure not yet available? It's not like the more commonly known vaccines, such as polio or influenza. We know exactly that if you make a certain antibody against polio or influenza, you will be protected when you're exposed to that virus. We're not certain that that's going to be the case with AIDS. The HLV3 virus or the LAV virus has the ability to change its protein coat. So we already know that depending on which part of the country you're from, you may have a different serotype of the virus. So developing a vaccine that will be, you know, far ranging is very difficult. These problems have not stopped scientists from seeking a vaccine or a cure, but they pose unusually difficult challenges. It may take years. A treatment of an infected person poses a two-pronged problem. First, elimination of the virus from the body, and then restoring the immune system so it can begin to function normally in preventing disease. The search goes on, and while it does, 
prevention is our best means of fighting this epidemic. While some scientists have been seeking a cure, a major accomplishment has been the discovery of a test to detect infection by the virus. Such a screening test is invaluable in preventing the spread of the disease through transfusion of contaminated blood. At a blood donor center, the first part of a screening test involves asking donors about their medical history. Have you had any night sweats? Unexplained fever weight loss? The laboratory screening test involves combining samples of a donor's blood with a preparation containing the AIDS virus. The test is used to screen every unit of blood in blood donation centers in order to assure that all transfused blood is safe. There has never been a risk of getting AIDS by being a blood donor. All equipment needle, tubing, and blood bag is sterile and used only once. If the blood test is positive, the blood is discarded so as to keep the blood supply safe. The test does not tell us if a person has AIDS. A positive test is a strong indication that a person has been infected by the virus that causes AIDS. It's a very good test. I also think it's a good test, if done in an anonymous setting, for people to find out whether they're, uh, whether they're a risk factor. As a result of this test, the blood supply in this country is now much safer than before the test was available. And so are such blood products as Factor VIII, the clotting agent needed by people with hemophilia. Unfortunately, before this test was established, blood containing the virus did make its way into the blood supply. As a result, many people with hemophilia and a very few other blood recipients were exposed to the virus. Given the long incubation period of the disease, we may yet see cases of AIDS resulting from blood transfused before the test was developed. Clearly, we are still experimenting, exploring, and gathering knowledge about AIDS. Yet today, our medical and scientific approach to this condition is hardly based on AIDS. The vast majority of cases of AIDS virus infection and subsequent cases of AIDS are transmitted through sexual contact, mostly homosexual contact in the United States. Uh, intravenous drug users who share needles or use unsterile needles um, account for about 17% of cases, 73% of cases in gay men. Transfusion of blood or blood products accounts for about 2.5% of cases. The fourth means of transmission, that's a very important one, is transmission from infected mothers to their fetuses and newborns, uh, probably usually in utero, but perhaps also during the birth process. From these means of transmission, it is clear that the virus knows no favorites. We have a virus, a virus that doesn't really care whether you're gay or straight, old or young, black or white, it really doesn't matter. If it is introduced into the body in a certain way, it can cause AIDS. If it isn't introduced in a, in a certain way, you don't have to worry about AIDS. As more and more heterosexuals get infected, the odds of being exposed to the virus heterosexually will increase. Along with sexual contact, the sharing of intravenous needles is a primary route for the virus to enter the heterosexual community. Approximately one quarter of all AIDS cases reported to the Centers for Disease Control involve intravenous drugs as a risk factor. Using illicit drugs has always been risky behavior. Now it is even more so, because the sharing of intravenous or IV needles can carry blood particles and with them the AIDS virus from one person to another. It's not the heroin or the cocaine that causes the HTLV3 virus to be spread. It's individuals sharing needles so that there's some contaminated uh, blood product left in the needle and in the syringe and then the next person by pulling up their own blood and by injecting the contents of the syringe whether it's heroin or cocaine or what have you into their own system are also injecting the virus because many prostitutes are drug users Men frequenting such prostitutes may endanger themselves and their other sexual partners. Bubble Slocket is a former prostitute and IV drug user, now diagnosed with AIDS-related complex. People don't think that it's ever going to hit them, so they don't care until it reaches them. 
and they just don't have a look at their husband as going out on the prowl, going out there to that prostitute that is IV drug user and a virus carrier. They don't even think like that. But that's a fact. Those are your best dates. The suburban dates. Yeah. Totally my anyway. HTLV3. It infects people in very specific ways. Those ways are limited by the fact that it is a sexually transmitted and a blood-borne virus. It is not transmitted like the measles or chickenpox or the common cold. These infections are far easier to catch than AIDS. As a result, we can draw many conclusions about how you will not contract AIDS. You will not get AIDS through coughs or sneezes. That is not the way the virus works. You will not get AIDS through shaking hands or hugging, even with an infected person. The AIDS virus simply doesn't work that way. You will not get AIDS from contact with public phones, toilet seats, or riding on the subway. The AIDS virus doesn't work that way. You will not get AIDS by including people from the risk groups in your circle of everyday friends or people you work with, because once again, the AIDS virus doesn't work that way. And you will not get AIDS by giving blood. Even within the households of persons with AIDS, there are no reported cases of such casual transmission. Kathy Neal cared for her brother in a household with children until the day he died from AIDS. In fact, I didn't recognize how close we were until he, he came down with AIDS and realizing that he was going to die. You reevaluate a lot of things and recognize a lot of things. And I had concerns. I think that um, it's just human nature to have some concerns. Um, I had two children living in my home, my children. And the thought of uh, ever putting in them in jeopardy was a great concern to me. However, I had educated myself and I felt comfortable. It is clear then that while AIDS is on the increase, it is not beyond our control. It is very much within the control of each and every one of us. Because it is not transmitted by who we are, but by what we do. While we have been able to associate risk groups with specific health-related behavior, there is one group receiving increased public attention, our children. At this point in time, several hundred cases of AIDS have been reported in children under 13. A few of these were infected through receiving contaminated blood before availability of the screening test. Like most infected children, the white bird got AIDS from being born to an infected mother. His father has hemophilia, and his mother contracted the virus through sexual contact before her pregnancy. While three members of this family have contracted the virus, Nicole, born earlier, has not been infected. Finally, I found somebody I really love, and we got our son, and we got a daughter, and I always think, why me, why us, especially when he's sick. He suffers a lot, and that hurts a lot. You always, you always think, what did I do? You know, did I do something to deserve this? Sadly, Dwight Burke died with AIDS in December 1985, before his second birthday. The number of children that are exposed to the virus in this country are the largest percentage are among minority children. Somewhere between 80 and 86 percent of the children in this country with AIDS are minority children. That says a whole lot. It says a lot to minority community leadership who have been resistant, who have seen this epidemic as being a gay issue. And it is not a gay issue. It is a public health issue. And newborn AIDS is a very devastating disease. So that women with the infection or with AIDS disease, we are counseling about the risks of pregnancy. Because if the test is positive, you might um, harbor the virus and transmit the virus to an unborn child. Come on. Come on. The way AIDS is transmitted to children is well known. Yet parents sending children to school still worry needlessly 
about casual transmission. I, I'm asked all the time if I will send my children to school uh, with AIDS patients. Since I have three children and I, people want to know, uh, although I'm a public health worker, do I do in my personal life what I proclaim and I, and I have. What people want is an absolute guarantee. Uh, an absolute guarantee that uh, I will have no risk. Uh, the public will tolerate no risk when it comes to AIDS. Quite different, of course, from risks that we tolerate from driving cars, getting hit by lightning, even doing things like smoking cigarettes. Hi, Jan. This concern has been found in the workplace where questions arise about transmission of AIDS to either co-workers or clients. The essence of the CDC guidelines are really that the, the workplace is a safe place, that AIDS will not be transmitted through casual contact. We now know enough about AIDS so that contracting it is partly a matter of choice, a choice of avoiding the risks that place us in harm's way. They can be educated to either stop using cocaine, certainly to stop using it intravenously, and absolutely educated against sharing needles. Condoms can prevent um, the semen deposition and would reduce the risk of a virus transmission considerably. I think the safest sex is having sex with one partner that you've been with for a long time. Very often with casual sex, people really don't know who their partner is, so that it's very important to avoid casual sex. It's not really worth dying for one night stand. People are not going to be celibate, but people can certainly learn how to select their partners with a little bit more discretion. I know it's a really big change in sexual habits for a lot of people, but it'll keep you alive. Some communities and groups in this country are going beyond fear and coming to grips with AIDS in positive, productive ways. Ways that prevent the spread of AIDS through education and public discussion. Ways that respond to the medical needs of persons with AIDS. Ways that support them socially and psychologically. The process began early with those first tentative steps of the few who recognize the real threat of AIDS. Many of these responses began in cities like New York and San Francisco, when those cities faced only small numbers of cases. As AIDS becomes more and more widespread, other communities that once thought themselves isolated from the disease are having to learn from these earlier models. All the states are sooner or later going to have a significant number of cases. Among the first responses was education on a one-to-one -one basis as individuals called out for help and information. AIDS information? Well, you have to feel confident about, about his sexual history. Our hotline answers over 6,000 calls per month, and the nature of those calls has changed very drastically, especially in the last few months. Um, about half of our calls are from heterosexuals. In San Francisco, the Stop AIDS Project has taken a proactive approach. Volunteers are carefully trained before they take to the streets to provide literature and information to people at risk. How long do they stay? Like, in Teenagers have become a key target of many communities trying to head off the infection cycle of AIDS. Virus has compromised. The Red Cross in Waterloo, Iowa, began such an education program. personally saw a need for AIDS education because of all the teenage exposure I have. I have two teenage sons and 10 to 15 uh, okays, I call them, other kids. And we have talked about AIDS on many, many occasions and you know, how it's transmitted, who's at risk, and what the symptoms are. I found out they weren't listening to me. But I thought if my own kids weren't listening, what are the other kids doing in high school? Education to stop AIDS addresses one concern. Coping with it where it exists responds to another. Both training and direct service offer answers. Too often overlooked are social and psychological support systems for persons with AIDS. The Shanti Project in San Francisco has provided a model that many have followed. But I don't care to set any world records. I don't want to have eight cases of, of pneumocystis. I think I've done what I set out to do, and I've had a wonderful life. I've enjoyed it, and I will continue to enjoy it, but I don't think I will 
could go through another, another hospital stay. I think I've had enough. Facing one's own death requires a very special kind of support. Experiencing the death of a loved one demands another. He died basically, I think, very peacefully. Judy Stone became a volunteer counselor because of the death of her son at the age of 19. And um, it's also because Michael was so young and he was still like at home, and also because he was an only child, knowing that other people were going through the same thing helped me a lot. In the face of this epidemic, it is clearer than ever that no man is an island. Personal issues affecting people with AIDS quickly become public issues that affect us all. Among the issues, children with AIDS in school. And I think the Swansea school system should be commended for the stand, and I commend oh. everyone. And I think the... Put yourself in this family situation. Have a little bit of compassion for this family and this boy. This is what they need. They need your support not your criticism. Reducing costs, offering services, educating people. These are among the ways some of us are confronting the epidemic. Through an understanding of AIDS, we can go beyond fear and help enhance the quality of life for ourselves and the people we know. That quality of life is enhanced because we can now embrace behaviors that decrease the likelihood of spreading this disease. It is enhanced because each of us can be safer. It is enhanced because people already afflicted with AIDS are treated with the personal humanity and the social support that we all need in threading our fragile way through our lifetimes on this planet. It's a human issue. And that you can work miracles as one person to another just by reaching out a hand and offering compassion and understanding um, and with love you can move mountains and i don't think in my lifetime that there's going to be a cure for aids but i think that a lot of us could move a lot of mountains